We are the fervent church, and our desire is to be people who are just fervent for Jesus, fervently seeking Jesus and his word. I hope that you guys, honestly, like you have this fervent passion. This, Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I don't know, again, this week has been very refreshing to me. As I'm hungry for the word, I'm like, Lord, just teach me. And man, it's just one of those things where I couldn't put down the Bible or, or log out of my Logos app where I'm just trying to learn more stuff. It was just very fulfilling, like Jesus was satisfying. So we're fervently seeking Jesus, fervently studying his word, fervently pursuing others because we want people to know Jesus. That's our whole slogan, but not just so other people can know Jesus, but that we may know Jesus more as well. Um, we're currently in our series in the book of Mark, which is John Mark's account of the gospel. And we kind of went over this a couple weeks ago of who John Mark was. But this series is titled Jesus Verified. Um, and Jesus Verified. So the, the whole point being is Jesus is who he says he is. Jesus is who scripture claims that he is, um, that he is the Messiah. He fulfilled the scriptures in the Old Testament that said of who the Messiah was going to be and what he was going to do. And Jesus, check this out, he will do what he said he's going to do in the future that's yet to come. So revelation, stuff like that, that will happen. And so the whole idea with this series is Jesus is verified. He is who he says he is. There's people out there who try to tear down the historical Jesus. And they're like, who really is the historical Jesus? And so they start to look into what they would say is history. And they're like, well, Jesus probably didn't live where the Bible said that he lived. And he didn't do what the Bible said that he did. And at least it didn't happen like that. But I want to tell you guys uh, just straight up is that Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible is the real Jesus. And he is the historical Jesus. And he's the verified Jesus. And we can trust the words that are written down here. And one reason being is that it was written a couple thousand years ago is when it was like finished with writing and since then it's been uh trying to be attacked and torn down and they're trying to find different things to prove it wrong and it's still standing today and here we are teaching the bible and just an amazing thing so jesus is verified we can trust what is written in the bible and i think we can trust mark's account one thing that comforts me is that mark was a dude who left the ministry of jesus for a while we don't know why. We could say that he maybe he had health issues. Maybe he fell into some type of sin. Maybe he had doubts. Maybe he was just tired and like, hey, I just need to go back home for a bit. But for whatever reason, Mark left the ministry, the one who wrote this account of the gospel that we're studying, and something happened. I feel like something had to have happened where all of a sudden like, he went back home thinking that things were going to be good and he was just going to go back to normal. But it wasn't the same. Right? It's like, it's like, man, this isn't fulfilling like it used to be. It's like something's missing. And then he, I just believe Jesus did something in his life there where all of a sudden he just realized that, man, nothing compares to living for Jesus. Nothing is as satisfying as living for Jesus. And so Mark came back to the group and eventually he wrote this gospel account that we're reading here tonight. Um, Last week we saw Jesus tempted. Jesus tempted, verified through temptation. You may think that Jesus or God doesn't understand you. He doesn't understand you. He doesn't get you. He doesn't care about you. And that's what a lot of people say out in the world. I've had professors at Pima back in Tucson, right, that would just mock God and Jesus. And it's like, how can you serve an impersonal God, right? And for me, it's just like, you don't read the Bible, do you? Like, you don't know who God is. And I, it just gets me a little heated, if you will. But we serve a God who understands us. And last week, we saw that Jesus subjected himself to temptation. And that very fact shows us that he loves us. Like, hey, I want to be able to sympathize with you. So Jesus, being God, subjected himself to be tempted by Satan so that he could tell us that I understand what it's like. I understand the struggles, right? It's been said before, like, like talk is cheap, right? We can say all that we want to say, and Jesus says a lot of things, and they are very important, but what I love about Jesus is that he backs it up with action, where he doesn't just say, I care about you. He shows it through everything that he does, and subjecting himself to temptation, just being one of those things. And so we see that he is a personal God, that he does care about us, and he understands our struggles. Um, temptation shows us, I mean, for one thing, Jesus being tempted should show us one thing as being followers of Jesus is that we will be tempted, um, obviously, right? It's like if he was tempted and he says, follow me, we're following him to be tempted as well. But what we saw last week is that Jesus fights temptation with something very specific, and that being the word of God. The word of God, it's our greatest weapon to defend lies, to defend the devil, to, to, to defend against the devil, 
Um, and so, but the, at the same time, this is one thing I was thinking about this week, is that this thing can be very, it, it can be dangerous in a good way, or it can be dangerous in a bad way. And I was thinking about it this way, is that like a gun. I'm not a big gun guy, and I'm one of those guys, like when someone has a gun and I don't know them, I'm a little like on edge. Like, I don't know, I'm going to be watching this guy, right? And, um, but then there's some of my friends who just know guns a lot, and I feel very comfortable and safe, and I don't really care. But I think about it this way, it's like a gun can be a very dangerous thing if it's in the hands of someone who doesn't know how to use a gun. They've never been through any training. They know that if they pull the trigger, that it'll shoot a bullet, but that's the only thing that they know about a gun, right? But if you have like a soldier who comes around, who's been to war, they've been trained for years and years and years. It's like all of a sudden that, that weapon, that gun, is actually something where he's, he knows how to wield it, if that's the right word. Um, he knows how to use it, and he's prepared. I think of the Bible this way. It's like it's, it can be used, and it can be very dangerous in the hands of someone who doesn't understand it. If you know a little bit of Scripture, that might be the most dangerous place because that's what Satan does. He says, hey, God didn't say that. He's just trying to hold out on you. That's what he did with Eve. Sold her little bits of God's word, but twisted it. Um, and so, and same thing when, with Jesus. He's like, he's like, hey, God said, if you throw yourself off, he's going to send his angels to come catch you, and you're not going to fall. And that's true. But again, if we only know a little bit of scripture, that's a dangerous place to be. But if we know the whole counsel of God, man, we are a prepared person, prepared for battle, prepared for temptation as Satan tries to come. And so the Word of God is our greatest defense against the enemy. Tonight what we're going to see is Jesus starting his ministry. And the, t- the title of tonight's message um, is my, my main point, and it is my thesis statement. And honestly, if we leave here with nothing else, I hope that this is the thing that you leave thinking about. And here's my title for tonight is th- simply this. Jesus started his ministry, and you should too. Jesus started his ministry, and you should too. So as we pick up tonight, we're going to dive into a packed text, even though it's two verses long in Mark. We're going to unpack it, um, and it it is packed. And just remember that Mark writes a high-speed gospel. It's like he's writing with such urgency. He's like, I don't know what to add and what not to add. And so he gives us like the highlight reel. If you guys have Instagram, it's like, it's like clicking on the stories and it's like you see a little bit of the story, but you don't get the full picture. You weren't there at the party or whatever. You just get a little highlight reel of it. And that's kind of what Mark's doing is giving us what we need to know, what's important so that you can go on and that you can tell others about it. It's like it's this urgency and I love it. So Bible's open. Mark chapter one, uh, verse 14 is where we'll start. Let's pray and we'll dive into this study. So Father, we just come before you, Lord. I pray that you would teach us, teach us tonight. God, give us a hunger and thirst for righteousness. God, I don't know what we've all been through this past week, Lord, but I know that you have revealed yourself to me in a very powerful way through your word, God. And I pray that you would do a similar thing to each and every one of us tonight, that you would show us the power of your word, the excitement of your word, that it is where we find life, God. It gives us life. You said that we don't live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. So feed us tonight, God. We pray that you would teach us, give us understanding to what your text means. Lord, if we're living in some type of sin, if, we've, uh, if we're, we're flirting with temptation, God, I pray that you would reveal that to us and just bring us back to you, God. And maybe if we don't know you at all and there's someone even listening in to this later on down the road, God, I pray that tonight would be a night where they would get to know you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Mark chapter 1, verse 14, it says this. Now after John was arrested, this is John the Baptist, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So that's the text we're going to look at tonight. We're going to unpack it. Again, Mark's high speed. He kind of gives us the cliff notes version, the highlight reel. But man, this text is everything. If we don't understand this text tonight, we are going to miss, miss it all. If we don't understand what Jesus is saying here, it's like we don't understand true uh, eternal life. And so first off, he opens it up. He says, now after John was arrested, this is John the Baptist. And again, Mark is just this high speed gospel kind of guy. He gives us like it's a big story, but he doesn't say much about it. He just mentions it very briefly. Um, But actually, truth be told, he goes into more detail in Mark chapter six. If you want to 
jump ahead, but, but we'll be in there in a couple months. But here's my paraphrased version of what happened to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was bold. He wasn't afraid of what people thought. All right, he's wearing camel's hair out in the desert, out in the wilderness. That's just a little weird. Eating locusts, that's a little weird, right? And then he's preaching repentance and baptizing people, which is also a little bit weird, right? Back then, it's just like, what do we need to repent of? What do we need to do? Like, like that wasn't the norm back then. So John the Baptist had a clear calling, and he was living it out. And so he was a bold man. Um, but what happened here, why he actually got arrested, and then it would actually lead to him being killed, beheaded, was that John was so bold that he was before uh, King Herod one day. King Herod, um, maybe they had some type of friendship. I don't know. Like, I don't know how John the Baptist got in to see King Herod in the first place. Maybe he was just like, hey, you're, people are following you and I want to know more. Maybe that's what happened. I don't know. But he had a chance. He had an opportunity to talk to King Herod. And King Herod, here's a little thing about him, is that he had a wife whose name was Herodias. You guys know who she was, though. You guys remember? She was Herod's brother's wife. So that was the problem there. So John the Baptist comes in and he's like, hey, Herod, I, I don't know what he said. I just can kind of imagine the scenes like, hey, man, I don't want to like be a big downer or anything, but like you having your brother's wife is not cool with God. You're living in sin. That's not okay. And he basically said it's not okay. Again, this is my paraphrased version. Go read Mark chapter 6 for your own studies there and we'll be there in a couple months. But uh, he, he says this is wrong. He calls it out, and it actually says that it pleased Herod to hear these things. Like, Herod was, like, getting, like, excited about hearing the truth. Like, what is this truth, you know? It's like people come to church sometimes, like, they're like, man, that was so convicting, and that was such a great sermon, yet then they go on afterwards, and they just live their life unchanged, unrepentant. It's like, that's almost what Herod's like. Like, man, I want to hear more because something was stirring up in my heart, and I've never got that anywhere else. And, but then Herodias didn't like it, the wife. She didn't like him calling out that, that this was not a good marriage, that this was not a marriage for God. And so she sought after John the Baptist to imprison him, and she wanted to kill him, but then Herod liked the guy, and he, he knew that other people liked him, so he didn't kill, her, kill him yet. And we'll get to that story. I won't spoil it all, but something to ask ourselves. John was so bold that he was willing to die for his, his commitment to Jesus, to God. And we should ask ourselves, do we have that type of faith and commitment to Jesus? Just, just like, hey, whatever comes, are we committed to telling the truth? Are we committed to telling people things so that they may know Jesus? See, living a life after God, following God, it, it does not and probably will not be an easy life. I think that's a misconception. It does not mean that it's going to be free from trials. Matter of fact, I think it's going to be more trials. So when we come out here to like, like plant a church, like when we're going through trials and seasons and we're like, why do we feel this way? Well, it's because we've stepped out for God in a big way and now he's coming at us, trying to attack us, trying to bring us down, make us feel discouraged, right? But do we have the type of boldness, commitment and faith like John the Baptist where it's like, hey, I'm sorry, Herod, but I got to tell you, you're in sin. I know you're the king and all and I could probably die for saying this, but I need to tell you it. Are we willing to take a stand for Jesus and start our ministry? And this is what I want us to understand, especially since it's like us church plant folks here, is that like when I'm talking about your ministry, I'm not talking about, hey, starting our church here. Okay? That's part of our ministry. But I want you to understand that God has a ministry for each and every one of you. Are you willing to take a stand and start your ministry, even if it may mean trials and hardship along the way? Even if it means that you lose friends along the way. And some things that ministry, ministry again, it doesn't just mean church, although I think church is a great ministry. It doesn't mean just serving in church, although I think we should all be involved in serving in church in some way or another. But here's a few things. It's feeding the hungry, clothing the, uh, the naked, caring for people just in general need. That's ministry. Talking with people, counseling them like, hey, how are you doing? That's ministering to people, you know, when you actually, hey, how are you doing? They open up to you, you give them some counsel back, you just give them an ear to listen. That's, that's ministry. Teaching people God's Word, obviously ministry, but it doesn't mean just from a pulpit standpoint, but like teaching God's Word at work when there's somebody there and they do something and you're just like, hey, like, the Bible talks a lot about that. 
that instance and whatever you're going through right now. Um, and that's, that's ministry. Giving someone a ride somewhere, that's ministry. And it can mean so many other things to us. But as followers of Jesus and Jesus minister to people, we should try to be like John in the fact that he's so committed to fulfill his ministry no matter what. No matter what. So that was, that John was arrested. Eventually he was killed. But John was arrested. Then it says, and then Jesus came into Galilee. And I want to hang out here for a minute and try to paint the picture. And this is where I got like just lost. Not really lost, but I was just enjoying Bible study. I just love knowing more stuff about it. So Galilee. Galilee is a special place, but honestly, it probably wouldn't be anything if Jesus hadn't been there. Galilee would have just been some town that nobody ever heard of. It, not a town, it's a region. Um, but Galilee is a special place, and it was special because that's where Jesus lived. That's where Jesus' like headquarters of ministry happened, and Scripture actually says that he lived there. To paint the picture a bit, Galilee was a small but large town, and I need to explain that, but Galilee was small in size, like geographically, it's probably 60 or 70 square miles. Um, and that's why Jesus could actually move around so much. When we look at scripture, we're like, how did Jesus get there on foot? This was before planes, trains, and automobiles. It's like, how did he get so many places? Well, it's because it wasn't that far. It wasn't that far. So Galilee was a region. And here's the thing to just paint the picture. So Galilee was like a state, okay? We live in the United States of America um, and in the great state of Texas. And we live right now, or we are in Hutto, a city. So Galilee, it would be like Israel is the country, Galilee is the state, then inside Galilee there are other little towns and villages, and some of those would be Nazareth and uh, Capernaum. Those are a couple towns or villages inside of Galilee. So Galilee, again, though it wasn't real big um, land-wise, but it was well populated is what uh, people would say. And so it wasn't very big in size, but it which again helps us understand how Jesus got so many places um, all the time. But Galilee wasn't very big, 60, 70 square miles. And so here's something I was just reading on. So how big is Austin? So Austin, the city, is 270 square miles. So it's much bigger than Galilee. But Hutto is eight square miles. So it's much smaller than Galilee. So you just kind of get a little picture just in our day and age. But even though Galilee was not large in terms of land, it seems as if it was well populated. And I think this is very important to note because even though Jesus didn't like go all over the world, and back then the world was very condensed over there in the Middle East. Like that was the whole world. Like America wasn't here yet, okay? Um, and so, so we think, well, how did Jesus impact the whole world? And he's just in such a small place. Well, it was because it was so well populated. And it's like, if you can impact the people around you, you can impact the world. And so Jesus starts to impact the people around him. And so what some um, commentaries and scholars say about Galilee is that it, I think it's Josephus, Josephus writes that there was 204 villages or towns inside of Galilee. That's a lot of towns. I don't know how many Texas has. I find out a new one every single day when I'm working for FedEx. There's a town like a little bit north called Waterloo. Did you know that? There you go. Okay, we have one person that knew that, two people maybe, and everyone else just learned something new. Waterloo is not just a can of water at Costco. It's a town in Texas. And, um, but anyways, so like there's 204 villages or towns in Galilee. And then one uh, commentary says this. He says that not one of the towns was less than 15,000 people. Like, that's a lot. I don't know if that's 100% true or accurate or where he got that information from, but you do the math. So 204 villages times 15,000 at the least, conservative in his view, that's over 3 million people. And I did the math, okay, just so you know. It's not like I just was like, oh, it's about 3 million. No, I, I entered it into my phone. What's 204 times 15,000? It's like 3 million 60,000 something. It's crazy. That's bigger than Austin. That's how many people Jesus is ministering to in this small 60 to 70 square mile region. Um, and again, I don't know how accurate that is. That's not in the Bible, 15,000 people. But if that's true from historians and um, other scholars, and man, that's a big deal. Like that's a lot of people that Jesus is ministering to. 
And, um, and then so more on Galilee is that it was a place populated by many people, both Jews and Gentiles. And why is that important? Well, first off, Jews, it's like Jews were the chosen people of God. They were kind of God's people, God's nation. And so I think a lot of people get like, oh, well, like they're the favored child, the firstborn. You get everything like it's unfair and it's jacked up for everybody else, but you just get all these good things and God's favor and blessings upon you. And they're definitely someone that was used in that way but then there's the gentiles and gentiles is just anybody who's not jewish essentially if we would just be real in a simple simple um definition anybody who's not jewish and so for all most of us i don't know if you guys are jewish or not but it's like for most of us we are gentiles and that's not like oh woe is me i'm a gentile like no i'm a gentile and that's okay and so galilee was a place filled with jews and gentiles although most of them would keep to their own city like they didn't they didn't interact a whole lot with other people. Like in, uh, was it John chapter four and Jesus is going, says he has to go to Samaria. Um, and then Samaria was a place that Jews didn't go because there's Gentiles there who are like acting like Jews. But anyways, that's another story for another time. But so there's Jews and Gentiles, and that's a big deal. It tells us something about Jesus. If Jesus is going to Galilee, if this is where he started his ministry, he started it here and because he came for all people, Jews and Gentiles alike. And I think that's important, especially in our day and age when we see a lot of division with race, ethnicity, different types of things. It's like Jesus came there for the Jews and the Gentiles both different races, ethnicities, backgrounds, lifestyles. And check this out. He came for even different people's beliefs. Um, I think that's, that's huge. Like people of different beliefs, serving different gods. It wasn't like Jesus was like, oh, what you serve Allah? Like, no, I can't deal with you. Like Jesus came to teach him the truth. He came to show him the light. And so he came for all people. And scripture says that God desires that all people would be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 that says that. So just note that as you pursue your ministry and your calling in life, you just note this is that be open to all types of people. I think we get too messed up when we focus on one person or one type of people group and we're like, I'm trying to reach these people. Just be open. Just be like, God, who do you have for me? And whoever God brings into your life, into your work, into your home, into your just realm of friends, it's like, just be open. It's like, okay, God, this is who we got. Like when I led the college ministry, we got a lot of people that I wouldn't go out searching for, but we got a bunch of people and it's like, well, all right, Lord, this is who you gave us and I'm going to love them and I'm going to teach them. I'm going to serve them as best I can. It's like, don't be so narrow-minded. Just be open to whatever God would do um, and, and use your life to impact and influence them. So Jesus comes to Galilee. That's the second part of that first verse. Comes to Galilee, a place filled with all types of people. But if we go a little bit deeper, these verses will be on the screen. Matthew chapter 4, it covers this in more detail in more detail, and it tells us why Jesus went to Galilee. Not just because it's all types of people, but check it out. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 says, Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And this is what was written The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death on them, a light has dawned. So again, that's Matthew chapter 4. And notice it's the same story as what we just read in those two verses. The same story, but with more detail. Like if you want to know Jesus more, read more of his word. If you want to get a fuller picture, start to read and understand scripture more. So John had been arrested. Same thing in Matthews. He says Jesus withdrew into Galilee. He says he left Nazareth. Um, This is why Jesus is called Jesus of Nazareth. He came out of Nazareth, and Nazareth is in Galilee. And he went and lived in Capernaum, which is also in Galilee. So don't think that it's a contradiction. Like, well, it said he was going to go to Galilee, but he went to Capernaum. What's up with that? It's like, no, Capernaum is in Galilee. But notice this is why he did this. And Matthew, I love his account. Number one, he did this and went to Galilee, to Capernaum, specifically to fulfill Scripture. 
All right? It was part of the plan. It wasn't an accident. It's like when Jesus does something, it's not on accident. Like, whoops, I didn't mean to fulfill Scripture. It's like he went there specifically to fulfill Scripture. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2 is the Scripture that was actually fulfilled. And we talked about that a few weeks ago where it's just, that was written six or seven hundred years prior to fulfillment. Like, that's just amazing testifies and verifies that Jesus is the Messiah. So he does it to fulfill Scripture, number one. But number two, he, he does it so that it may be said that the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. He came to the darkness to show them a little light. But, but check it out. He, he came so that it may be said that the people in darkness have seen. It doesn't say that they, he came so that it may be said that they have believed in the great light. It's like the light has shined, it's shown. It's like now you have the opportunity. Do you want to accept it or reject it? Um, so he goes to Capernaum in Galilee. A little more about Capernaum, the actual name, like if you get into that, it's like it means a, uh, it means a disorderly accumulation of objects. Like that's what, one of the definitions that comes from that name, Capernaum. A disorderly accumulation of objects. So just a place out of order. That's really what, it's, what it means if we want to just boil it down. And it's just interesting to know that that's where Jesus goes. That's where he sets up his headquarters. That's where he's planting a church. Isn't that crazy? It's like he goes to the darkness to plant this church. And it says in that he went there, he lived there. And this is when he started his public ministry. He went to the disorderly, we could say, to put things back into order. But check this out later in Matthew's account, and this is Matthew chapter 11. I think we'll have this on the screen as well. It says this, though, about Capernaum. He says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. There's some mighty words, like weighty words. Like this is like if Jesus said that to you, it's like, hey, it's going to be better for Sodom than it is for you. What he's saying is that you are deeply flawed. You are deep in your sin, your unrepentance, because because remember back to the Old Testament, it's like God rained down fire and sulfur on Sodom because of their unrepentant, sinful lifestyles pretty hardcore that's pretty hardcore and and then jesus here like that's the the next step further is saying like you are worse than sodom that's what he's saying to capernaum he's saying you guys are more sinful than them so think about it when we're thinking about this it's like okay jesus is starting his ministry he's fulfilling scripture but he goes to the darkness and really what we could say like the dark the the darkest place that you can get is what it seems like um, he goes there uh, to start his ministry, to be a light, so that it might be said that a great light has shone. And so what this should tell us in starting out, just kind of like Jesus started his ministry, and you should too. It's like Jesus started his ministry, he went to the darkness, and as followers, we should too. I mean, that was one of the things that we talked about, me, Amber, Sam, and Morgan, like when we were first like meeting about just starting a church at all. This was one of the verses, Matthew chapter 4, where it talked about how in this land of darkness, a great light has shown. We're like praying, like, God, where do you want us to go? And we're thinking Dallas, maybe? We're like, I don't know. Like for me, I'm just like, everybody's saved in Dallas, right? It's like they got the mega churches of mega churches there. And so, like, we're like, well, where would Jesus go? And we start to think, it's like, okay, well, like, who needs the light the most? And I don't mean any offense to anybody in Texas or in Austin or anything, but it's like, we just believe that, man, there's not a lot of churches in Austin. One guy told, I think, me and Sam and maybe Caleb, he said that, that downtown Austin is where church plants go to die. You remember that? He said that's where church plants go to die. That's because it's so dark here. It's like they're just eating them up. And so anyways, and our crazy conclusion to that was like, we got to go to the darkness and we need to go to Austin. Like, so crazy. But here we are doing it. And so where do we go? We go where Jesus went. He went to the darkness and that's where we're going to go. Where does the light shine the brightest? In the dark, right? Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. 
So as followers of Jesus, we shouldn't stay away and try to like protect ourselves so much from like sinful people uh, necessarily. Rather, we should try to like minister to them, minister to them, teach them, love them, serve them, whatever that might look like, whatever they need, right? That's what Jesus did. Like he just was doing life. And as people came about, he didn't push them away. It's almost like, what do you need? And he would give them what they need. Sometimes it was things that they didn't even know they needed, right? Like the woman wanted water, and he's like, I got living water for you. And it, it's amazing, right? Jesus gives them what they need, so we should give them what they need as much as we can. And so that's not to say, though, like, go to the darkness and embrace their sinful lifestyle and go to the bars and the clubs and all the stuff with them and, and do those things. No, there should be a difference. They should be able to tell. It's like, there's something different about you, like, than everybody else. And so part of our ministry is just just going out, loving people, putting the truth out there so that people may know Jesus. And, and this is one thing, one way that I think about it is you need to understand that in ministry, you're not failing if you told someone about Jesus and they didn't give their life to the Lord. That's what I want us to understand, like in a very real sense, like right here, like we have our church plant group. This is us here. Like we're not failing tonight because... We don't have a packed house. We, we are doing our ministry. We're doing what we're called to do. We have put out invitations. We've invited people, and, we, and people have come, and it's good stuff. But just understand, part of our job is to just simply put out the invitation. That's our job. We can't save them. We can't get them to change their life. We put out the truth. We say, this is the truth. In a sense, we're like, hey, we're like the lawyer. Like, this is the plea bargain that they came up with, with the Lord, God Almighty, by the way, came up with, here you are, it's on the table. Would you like to take that offer or not? Right? Like, I, I've been to jail before, and there was a plea bargain, right? And it's just like, the lawyer was like, do you want to take this? And I was like, that sounds pretty good. Two days or 12 days. I'm going to take the two. Okay? And um, that's what we're doing, though. We're, we're presenting the plea bargain. Here's the truth. Now it's up to you. And, that's, and part of the result is people are going to reject it. But understand this, is that even if they reject it, we're still doing our work. We're fulfilling our ministry because God's going to use that one day when they're before the Lord. And they're like, Lord, I didn't know about this. And they're going to be saying, wait, remember that one time when that dude told you about me? That I came so that, that whoever believes in me would not perish? It's like now all of a sudden there's evidence against it. So we should be fulfilling our ministry in the darkness no matter what. So Jesus goes to Galilee, and then the word that he has for him is powerful. And like I said, it, starting out, this is everything. I mean, this is, this is everything. If we don't get this, we miss, we miss it. And so he says this, he gives him a word. Uh, and have you ever had someone come up and say, man, I got a word from the Lord for you, or I got a word for you that I just feel like I need to tell you? And sometimes it's good stuff, and it's, I believe it's true. I believe it's a, a prophetic gift. Um, I've experienced it, but then I also, there's times when I'm like, that's crazy nonsense, you know. I, I appreciate you sharing that. Not really, but I, I'm going <laughs> to, you know, it's just there's some craziness to it, but like Jesus has a word for them, and this is what I want you to understand. Jesus has a word for us, and even if we're all saved in this room, it would do us well to just understand this and just get re, like, excited about what is going on here. So Mark chapter 1, verse 15, he says this. It says, He came to Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And let's pause right there, actually. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So let's break that down real short, simply. The time is fulfilled, meaning like, hey, the season of like life apart from God is over. Like the season when you had to try to atone for your sins in Hebrews, we would say, it basically says that you could sacrifice all day long and you still wouldn't be able to pay for your sins, which is crazy, right? Because like what that tells me is like God gave them in a, um, a task that is not achievable in the Old Testament. It's like, hey, you know, go ahead and sacrifice all these animals to atone for your sins. But the, at the end of the day, it was all a picture pointing towards Jesus that Jesus is going to come. John the Baptist, being bold, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Right? And so, anyways, he says the time is fulfilled. Like, like that season is over. God is here. Emmanuel. God with us. The time is fulfilled. 
Um, and our ultimate atonement, our Savior, Jesus, is here. And so he says the time is fulfilled, and he says, and the kingdom of God is at hand. I, I love this, and this is the one thing that I was just getting excited about again. He's, the kingdom of God is at hand. Basically what he's saying is, it's this close. As far as your hand is away from your face. He's like, the kingdom of God is right here. It's not some far off theology or idea that you need to wait for forever to come. Jesus is like, it can be experienced right here, right now. He's like, it's real, it's here. And this is the thing he's doing is he's inviting us all in. The kingdom of heaven is at hand and I want you to come in. It doesn't matter your nationality, your ethnicity, your past sins. He wants you to know that you are invited into his kingdom. And that you can be a part of it. And what I love is the next part of the verse is because if he didn't give us the next part, we'd be a little screwed. Right? It's like, okay, the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand. Awesome. It's like pointing at that house. That's yours, but the door's locked. Like, how do I get in? Like, I can't get in without the keys, but here's the keys to getting in. Repent and believe in the gospel. What I would say is the two keys to, to getting into the kingdom of heaven. Like, these are the two things that we have to do, and I don't want you to think that we have to do works to get in, but we do need to do something, right? It's like if Jesus calls, we got to pick up the phone. Say, what's up? What do you got for me? Right, so the two keys to getting into to the kingdom is repent and believe. And they both go together. You can't get in. Like it's, like it's like on a house, you know, when you got two locks, you got a deadbolt, and then you got the doorknob. Sometimes they're two different keys. That's like what this is. It's like the top one's repent. Okay, I got it. But the bottom one's locked, and it's a different key. Yeah, it's believe in the gospel. So repent means this. It means to turn. It, it, it's a verb. And this is what I love just again about Bible study. You just learn some more stuff about it. Repent is, the, I believe, the Greek word metanoia. Metanoia, and what it like means is meta means change, like change, and then noia is mind, and it's change your mind. But the thing is, it's not just like this this word that you say. It's not a descriptive word like an adjective or whatever that you would use to describe something. It's a word that's a verb. It's an action word where you repented. It's like you were going this way, but then you metanoia, you changed your mind. You're like that's not a good idea, and now you're going somewhere else. See, it's one thing to tell people you'll do something, right? But actually doing it shows that you're serious about it. And I was thinking of, I think, the greatest example that honestly relates to Scripture and our growth in spiritual life is like physical fitness. And I, I know you guys know that I coach CrossFit and I'm all into that. But like how many of, I mean, all of us have done this, right? Where we're like, man, I want to get in shape. I want to I eat healthier I want to, whatever, you know, I want to lose weight. I want to, whatever the case is, like you want to get healthier and you want to go to the gym and that's part of your thing, right? So it's one thing to say like, hey, I'm going to start eating healthier and clean up my diet. Like that's like saying it, but like to actually do it, like that's when you're like, oh, you're serious. And so the thing about going to the gym, like it's like you could say like, yeah, I want to start going to the gym. But then you go to the gym, right? First day, like you don't really notice a big difference. It's not like you're you're all buff and skinny and whatever you want to be. Um, it takes time. But over time, all of a sudden, people around you are going to notice. The thing about repentance is like, hey, people might not notice like day one, but like day 30 or day 130, all of a sudden people are going to be like, hey, something's different about you. What changed? Well, what changed was I changed my mind about what I was pursuing. I repented. I got serious about it. And it's not that I said like, oh, I, Lord, I repent of my sins. You can say that. It starts with that. But it's like you have to follow through. So to repent, when Jesus says repent, he says do something. And really what he's saying is do something different. Because what you're doing is not working. And it will never work. And so he says you got to repent. And again, repentance, it's like over time it will, it will show its fruit. And I believe part of the fruit is showing that you truly believe. And I think about back in, uh, right after high school, it was like I was 20 years old or so, and me and my friends were involved in drugs and alcohol and stuff, but my friend, one of my best friends, Seth, and probably all of you know him, um, he comes over, and I, in my mind, I'm like, he's 
a little crazier than me. Like, I'm like, I know I'm crazy a little bit and I like to do drugs and get a little carried away with that. But I'm like, but Seth is on another level, okay? And I'm thinking like, that's how I viewed him. He knows I view him that way. So it's not like I'm telling him anything he doesn't know if he sees this. But one day we're at my house. We're all, we're all about to smoke weed and we pass it to Seth. And Seth said, no, I'm not doing that anymore. And, and we're kind of like, well, why? Right? And he's like, well, I gave my life to Jesus. And so for me, and so if you know some of my background, it's like I grew up in the church. Um, when I was 13 is when I started smoking weed. And then when I was 15 is when I stopped smoking weed, the first time anyways. And that's because I, I, I honestly understood the gospel for the first time in the Bible. Like I grew up in church, but it wasn't until I was like thir- or 15 that I just realized there's a difference. I realized what it meant to be on fire for the Lord and indwelled or whatever you're like the Holy Spirit dwelling in me um, it was just a total different experience I gave my life to the Lord I quit smoking weed um, and at that point I hadn't dabbled in any other drugs or anything it was just I smoked weed w- with my friends so I lived it was like junior year and almost all of senior year I was like the Jesus freak of Palo Verde High School which you know there's 300 and something people just in our graduating class. There's over a thousand people at our school. It's a big school. And so I was the Jesus freak and I was okay with that. But senior year rolls around, all my friends who when I was 13 and I was smoking weed, like they didn't because they were the goody two shoes. No, that's crazy. We're not supposed to do that. It's bad for you, right? And which is right. So I'm not trying to make fun of them. Like you you shouldn't do drugs. But senior year rolls around and now, now all of a sudden they think like, well, yeah, let's check this out. Let's see what this is about they start smoking weed and so me like i'm being tempted with things that i used to be and instead of actually pushing away and like saying no man i'm not gonna hang out with you guys i'm like i got the holy spirit in me i got this like i'm gonna go to the party i'm good i'm gonna show them jesus love it's like and i subjected myself to to temptation and that's not a good thing obviously right and so i put myself in that 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 place and um as the Bible says, bad company corrupts good morals, and that's what happened to me. And so then I had a beer, and then next thing you know, I had a few beers, a few shots, and then I got drunk for the first time. I remember getting drunk for the first time. I got up off of my friend's couch, and I couldn't walk straight. I'm like, what's wrong with me right now? Like, I've never been this way, and then it clicked in my head. I said, I'm drunk. Like, and it was like an immediate, like, conviction, yet at the same time, I kind of enjoyed it because it was like eating the forbidden fruit. Like, my eyes were open. And so then I got drunk, and then one day I'm drunk outside. My friend, I'm sitting down, and my friend is smoking weed right next to me. And again, just stupid. Why am I subjecting myself to this kind of temptation? And then he says, do you want to want to smoke this? And so I'm, yeah, sure, why not? And then I just started smoking weed, and I started doing all kinds of other drugs. And so my thought when Seth was like, I'm not doing that anymore. I gave my life to Jesus. I'm thinking, I've done that too, Seth. That's cute. You know, you'll be back. That's what I thought. So I thought in my head, you will be back. Like, not that I don't believe in Jesus, not that I don't believe in God and any of those things. I just thought you're going to be back because that's what happened to me. That's what's going to happen to you. But then over time, you know, days go by and Seth doesn't come back or he comes over. And instead of like me being weak and indulging in sin and kind of like creeping into it, Seth's like, no, I'm not doing that. And he like intentionally doesn't drink anymore or whatever. It was very convicting to me. Again, I knew the Holy Spirit. I knew God. I knew what His Word said. And I'm being convicted because I'm like, this. I should be you, Seth. I should be telling you this stuff. Cause I, and, and Seth knew that too. He knew that I knew the Bible and he would use that against me in a good way. Um, but it was just so convicting because then it's like week or day after day, week after week, month after month, all of a sudden I realized that this dude is serious. He repented And it was obvious. Repentance should be obvious to people over time. It should be obvious in your life. John the Baptist, I I think it's in maybe John's account, but he talks to the Pharisees, he says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Like, repentance should bear fruit in your life. Just like going to the gym should change you eventually. Changing your diet should change you eventually. And if it doesn't, then you're you're not doing it right. You know? So he, he starts with, 
Repentance, that's key number one. Change what you're doing. Like you might have been doing one thing, but he says repent, turn from it, and go another way. And then the second key is and believe in the gospel. And belief, it's another uh, action word. It's a verb. It's not a passive word, not a descriptive word to just say like, oh, I believe in Jesus, like this, this thought, this ideology. No, belief is something you choose to do. It's like, I am choosing to believe this. I'm choosing to believe it, and belief should bring about, just like with repentance, belief should bring about action. I think a word we could we could put in there instead of belief to help us understand more is faith. We're like, oh, I got faith. Right? Like I got faith in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. They're kind of interchangeable. But James chapter 2, verse 17, it says this: faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So we could put in the words like, so belief by itself, if it does not have works, is dead because belief should be an action. I believe in Jesus, therefore I'm going to start living for him. Believe in the gospel. And what he's saying is, that's very important. Don't just believe in anything, believe in the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Because that's the only thing that's going to really save anybody. Believe in Jesus, and belief in Jesus, again, should result in action. And now hear me on this, because we put this verse up here. So faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Um, So we're saying, like, you need works in your life. But understand, we are not saved by works. We're not saved. Like, we don't do works to earn salvation. We don't do works to earn salvation faith like oh now i have faith we don't do works like oh now i believe right it's like we don't do that we do works because we have salvation because we believe like that's why we do works because we're saved because we have faith because we have repented we we believe and that's where our works come from out of there so belief true belief it's like if you really believe um going to the gym is going to make you healthier like you should be living it out like, we do works because we've repented of that. Um, stop living for ourselves. Now we're going to start living for Jesus. And so that's what, that's what, those are the two keys, repent and believe. You need both. It's like you can't get into the kingdom if you don't repent of your sins. You can believe in Jesus, right? But if you haven't repented of your sins, then you're still dead in your transgressions. But it's like, but if you believe in Jesus, or if you've repented of your sins, but you don't believe in Jesus, well, you missed the biggest thing ever. Like, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's like, so you ain't getting in if you don't believe in Jesus. At all, you don't even have a chance. Uh, Repentance, I wrote this down. Repentance without belief, think about it. Maybe there's people in your life, it's commendable, because it's like someone changed their life, but they don't believe in Jesus. You have any people you know about like that? Um, At the restaurant I used to work at, there was a bartender she used to be a heroin addict, but she's, she's like a full-blown atheist. Like, like, me and her had many conversations, and most of them were civil, which was always fun because we would engage and just understand each other's mind. Like, why do you think there's no God? And then she'd be like, why do you believe the Bible? And we just had these conversations. But she was a heroin addict, and so when she went to rehab, she knew she needed to change, like she needed to repent of being a heroin addict. And so she would go to all these rehabs and none of them would work. And she said all of them were faith-based, although not necessarily Christian-based. She's like, it was all about a higher power and she didn't believe in that. Um, so she, she had trouble for a while, but then she found a program that worked for her. And I don't know exactly what it was, but as far as I know, it's like to this day, and that was 10 um, maybe more years ago that she became clean, she has been clean. And so for me, that's mind blowing. I'm like, you repented of sin. I didn't know you could repent of sin, uh, without the Holy Spirit, right? It's like, and so that shows me something is that God has actually put probably more in you than you think. Like you can change your ways of living, but all that does repentance. It's like you have enhanced your life on earth, but you're still doomed to hell. You still don't have eternity. And so, like, it's commendable. Like, man, that's awesome that you got off heroin. I don't know how you did it without Jesus, but praise the Lord. I know you don't believe in him, but man, it was totally the Lord. Uh, You know what I'm saying? But repentance without belief, it's nothing. It doesn't do us any good. And likewise, belief without repentance, what is that? That's hypocritical. Uh, Well, I believe in Jesus, but I'm still getting drunk and high and doing whatever I want to do. Right? That's why people hate the church and don't want to come here. They don't want to hear about Jesus. They don't want to hear about the, the Bible because they're like, everybody's hypocrites. 
They say that they believe in loving and serving people, but man, they're just full of judgment and, and just looking down on people and they're arrogant and think they know it all. It's like belief without repentance doesn't do us any good either. It's hypocritical and it's, it's honestly like repulsive. When you see a hypocrite, you're just like, I don't want anything to do with that. That's part of my heart's desire that we would show the world, or at least the world around us, that we are a church who's hopefully not hypocritical, where we're like, no, we, we know we're wrong, okay? Like, we're not trying to say we're, we're 100% right and know it all, so it's like, if you don't know it all and we don't know it all, welcome to the club, come on in, man, it's for everybody. Jesus is for everybody. And so, belief without repentance is, is foolish, but repentance with belief, again, the two keys, is a powerful thing, a powerful thing. It's where we find the true abundant life that Jesus talks about in John chapter 10. Like, if we repent and we believe in the gospel of Jesus, man, that's where true life comes from. It's where we find ourselves, like when we repent and believe, we're not working for salvation anymore. We're working from a place of, we already have it. Like, since I'm saved, since Jesus died for me on the cross, since he rose from the grave there. It's like, because all that has happened, like, and I have repented and chose to believe in it, now I want to live for him. I want to live for him. Like, we, we got to understand that. And that's what the next thing is. Like, when we start our ministry, we repent and believe. That's the first call for us, where it's like, if you want step one, repent and believe. Because the kingdom is at hand, and if you want in, then that's what you got to do. The next step, I would say, is like Matthew 28. It's like, now go and, and make disciples of all nations. That's the next thing. It's like, so really what we see is like Jesus is the foundation. We don't need to make a foundation. It's already there. So the work has been done. And then what we're doing is like building upon what Jesus did. But think of it this way. I was thinking, I was like, okay, Lord, like it's kind of like you've laid the foundation, like the concrete slab, and we're building the house. And I feel like God, like it kind of like revealed to me, like, no, I built the house. Like I built, I, I am the slab. I built the house. Your job is to fill it. I was like, dang, okay. Like, that's what it is. It's like, we're not doing any work. We're not like, oh, Lord, I'm going to build a church. What does that even mean? Like, uh, we can build things to bring honor to the Lord, but really, we're just trying to get people into heaven. That's what God calls us to do. So we repent and believe in the gospel. It's the keys to the kingdom, as Jesus says. He's like, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. And so it's the keys to the kingdom. It's the keys to a relationship with God. If you want to know him more, you start with repenting and believing in the gospel. And then the keys, now that we know what they are, and we know this stuff, it's like now our, our responsibility is to share those with others. We share it with others and let them in. Jesus, as he started his ministry, again, we saw he started in a dark place, in a place that was out of order, probably what seemed to be a bad time and place to start a ministry and I think of the fervent church and I'm like the middle of COVID-19 in a foreign land for all of us to sewn ins and stuff and it's like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense but I feel comforted because Jesus goes to a place out of order that's dark and messed up and, and out of control and that's where Jesus started his ministry so if he started there what we can learn here uh, is we shouldn't wait for the perfect scenario the, the stars to align, everything to open back up for us to start our ministry. And again, re realize I'm talking about like you, me, individually, what your ministry is. I don't know exactly what your calling is, but I know that it's more than just sitting here and serving in church on Sunday. I think that dude works at FedEx. I've seen that car before. Sorry. Anyways. Um... Total side note, had nothing to do with anything. Thank you for that. But uh, the perfect time, it's not going to come. The time, as Jesus would say, the time is fulfilled. And I mean, for us, it's more fulfilled than it's ever been, where it's like, and the kingdom of God is at hand. It's like, Jesus is coming back any day, and so we should be doing our part to just try and get people in. And, and first off, make sure we're getting in. Like, if you guys are living in sin, like, we got to repent of those things. And, and was it Galatians uh, five that I shared last week <clears throat> where it talks about it's like those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God like the the idea is like those who are living in sin will not inherit the kingdom of God it's not those who stumbled and messed up it's like we stumble and then we repent 
And then we believe, oh yeah, that's right. Jesus died for my sins on the cross and it's because of Jesus I'm forgiven. And I believe it. And I believe that Jesus rose again. He's going to make a place for me and he is coming back again. Therefore, I'm going to live for him in the meantime. And so we got we to gotta live like he's coming back tomorrow. The kingdom of God is at hand. So just as Jesus started his ministry in a somewhat sketchy setting, it's like we got to start ours. What are we waiting for? We start by, like I said, we let Jesus minister to us, but it's like after the repentance and belief is there, like now we got to go and do something with it. We got to tell others. I want to close with reading this. I don't know if the screen's, is it working? 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, and it says this. It says, I, and this is Paul speaking, he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. And I believe like we're seeing that happen more today than ever before. It says, The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and turn away from and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. But verse 5, listen up. As for you... Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. It's your, your God-given calling. It, it says in Romans, I believe, chapter 10, that the calling of God is irrevocable. Like, basically saying, it's like, you can do whatever... Like, I've heard it's put this way once, is that God's like a GPS. It's like when you go the wrong way, it doesn't yell at you and scream at you and punish you. No, it just says recalculating. And like obviously sometimes you take a wrong turn and now it's like all of a sudden instead of a five-minute drive, it's a 15-minute drive. And that's how it is with God sometimes, like recalculating. It might take a little bit longer to get there and to fulfill your ministry because you added some turns that we weren't supposed to take in there, but He's going to get us there. And so it's like, we got to fulfill our ministry. It's ours for the taking. God has one for you. So seek God. Repent and believe and start your ministry. Jesus started his ministry, and so should you. Amen? Will you guys stand with me and let's pray? Father, we just thank you for your word. It is exciting. It's alive. It's active, God. And I just pray that you would continue to give us a hunger and thirst for it. That this wouldn't be the only time we read your word this week, God. This, this wouldn't be the only time we think about your word this week, God. Help us to understand that you started your ministry and you're calling us to start ours as we follow you. God, help us to repent of any sins that have gone unconfessed or if we're living in sin, God, help us to repent. And that, again, it means to change, to turn. Lord, help us to turn. Give us courage to turn. Boldness. Give us just a sick, like a... Help us just to be sick of sin, that we're just so ready to turn from it. God, help us to repent and turn and believe in you. And God, as we turn to you, God, would you reveal yourself to us? Would you show us what your word means? Would you just give us an excitement, a fervent desire to know you more? And God, as we believe in you, God, give us opportunity to fulfill our ministry, our God-giving calling. Lord, this week I pray that you would open doors that we've, we've yet to see in our lives. And that we would see them open, Lord, and we would know without a doubt that it is you. That it is from you and that this is our opportunity to practice what we believe. God, so give us opportunities. Go before us. Keep us safe this week, Lord. And uh, just show yourself to us more and more each day, God, and just help us to just be excited that you're here and that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, God, and help us to take that news to the people around us that they may know you as well. And we pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.